And one girl I was talking to that was like part of our production, she was out on, on set and somebody came up and they go, oh yeah, what are you guys doing? She goes, oh, we're filming a commercial for a mayonnaise company. And he goes, oh really, what brand? And she See, was that's like, exactly what I would say. Uh, right Kevin what are you doing all right Kevin we're ready to go live man hit the button <clears throat> did he the, do it the button Micah did he do it the button we really need to work on that sign it is very slam dumb. dunk slam dunk it thanks Kevin do it do it you got it you got it here it is if you make this you get to go Not home block it. <laughs> terrible you missed you completely <laughs> all right I swear to God, he's gonna throw that. Don't out hit the cut water yeah. glass bottles. All right, let's get this podcast going. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Cut Water. Speaking uh, of Cut Water, yeah, thanks yeah, for sponsorship. thank you for helping us out today um, and every day. Can I get sponsored by Pure Leaf? Maybe you ask this every time you have some non-alcoholic drink that you're like, what about this? Oh yeah, that's right. I did that with Lacroix, didn't I? <laughs> Maybe we can call the water department and see if they will um, sponsor you. Thank you, District of Water. Park what about department. the guy that we get the water from all the time? Ooh, Liquid Death. Ooh. That'd be cool. Oh, dude, Jace. The okay. salsa guy? Yeah, the salsa guy. Yeah. Well, no, salsa guy right is his buddy. He sells his salsa, Action Salsa, which is rad. Um, but Jace and the water source here in San Marcos, uh, we buy all of our water from him. He's the man. So he Alkaline, also sells ice. pH neutral, something or other. It's, yeah. pretty, it's good, though. It's Hi. the best water I've tasted. He's a water processor. Best water I've tasted. Dude, it really <laughs> Liquid is. Liquid Death would be a sick sponsor, though. Okay, yeah, it would be. But in all honesty, that. dude, like when you have this water, I fill this canteen up and then I go home and then I have to refill it from like our refrigerator thing. And I'm like, oh. Dude, fridge, just, fridge water never tastes good. It just same. tastes gross, dude. Yeah, I think it's, it's just because like there's no way you can clean any of that. No. There's just. Yeah. We have a we have reverse osmosis at our house and it's pretty good. It's still not as good as the it's alkaline. Not, it's not the same. It's not the same. Curtis, can you stop touching your microphone? <laughs> Thank you. Do you drink Liquid Death, though? Yeah, I mean, if it's available. Dude, I know they're, like, a little pricey, and people always make fun of me and Troy for buying them, but those are so good. Those are super good. Super good. Even just the regular, like, canned still water that's, like, $2 for a tall can of water. Mm -hmm. Worth it. hits different, you know? I've never had one. Really? Really? They're super good. Except the ones that they have now, the the sweet tea ones or the mango tea ones, they have so much sugar in them. Really? Yeah. Only you would notice I know. Got to read the can before I drink it. Got to read the can. Yeah. Does anyone else want to admire that Kevin's just eating a plain hot dog bun? Is that what that leftover is? Leftover from Weenie Wednesday. Dude, yeah, leftover from Weenie Wednesday. We got a bag of hot dog buns. Kevin's been slowly consuming them. You didn't even warm it up. You're just straight <laughs> no, carbon. He's, he's pulling he's it. Carb load. Oh. oh, oh, that was the okay. whole thing. In For our shot. audio <laughs> listeners, Kevin just shoved the entire hot dog bun in his mouth in one bite. It was impressive, actually. <clears throat> All right, so for this podcast, um, we have any guests here today keeping it... Uh, Loki, back to what we used to talk about a lot. I want this whole podcast to be very technical. So if, Tech day. So if you're still listening, it's, uh, it's going to be too. Tech Tuesday. Tech Tuesday, yeah. Tech Tuesday. Uh, it's going to be very tame and very technical. So for those of you who are listening right now and you want tame and technical, that's what's going to happen. I apologize. Everybody but. shuts it off right now. I guarantee yeah. it. <laughs> Click. And they're not fun anymore. <laughs> no, we're still fun. We're just trying to reel it in a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, Jake brought up a, uh, a story earlier today that I really want to talk about, and it kind of goes with some of the jobs that we've had in the shop uh, the last couple of days, um, and that and that is uh, Jake. You can tell us all about it, and, and uh, without calling anybody out or before anything, you go any further. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Good. This is uh, this is good because it'll <laughs> just you'll immediately know what I'm talking about, though. Okay. You brought up uh, some social media you were on. And there was a post about somebody asking for advice. As oh, we all yeah, found. now I remember. Got it. So we, we all go on social medias, <laughs> forums, all these different places. And people 
will ask for advice, which is good. This is why we have the internet, right? It's because we have a forum of people that we can ask their opinion. Problem is, is that you're going to get an opinion from everybody on the planet, and none of them are going to jive. So <clears throat> I, I thought maybe we could talk in, in detail about what this person's specific problem was, and if you are that person, you can call us and we can talk to you about it in person, but um, Jake's going to try to find it. But ultimately, yeah. I think what happened was somebody had a Jeep, right? And they brought it to an alignment shop. And the alignment shop said that they needed more caster, that they couldn't get enough caster for the Jeep. And that the only way that they could fix it is to put in ball joints that have offset degrees. So it's called an offset ball joint. And... That's fine. An alignment shop can recommend that. Those are products that are available, and there's technically nothing wrong with those products that are available to do an offset ball joint. Um, my, my biggest problem with that is why does that person need offset ball joints in a factory Jeep? Because the Jeep was designed with caster, and why is the caster gone? Is the caster gone because he has worn out parts? It was, it was lifted, but yeah. So Okay, it's, so it's lifted, right? Bigger so, tires? Yeah, so how do you deal with this? You, you lift your vehicle, and you lose caster, right? And then, and then what you can do is you can get adjustable control arms to try to get that caster back, right? But then you start losing pinion angle, so now you have vibrations in your drive shaft. So there's all these byproducts of lifting your Jeep that have to be dealt with. Um, now, an alignment shop... I don't think that whatever alignment shop they went to was steering them wrong. I think that alignment shop was doing what they know. Yeah, they just don't know the specifics of this. So I actually just found the post right now, and it said, went to an alignment, uh, went to get an alignment today at a reputable shop. They told me that I need to get adjustable ball joints to adjust the caster because it's pulling slightly left. What adjustable uh, uh, law? What adjustable ball joints is everyone running? I've never been a public speaker, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so just at first glance because he posted a picture up and um it's a two-door jk it to me it doesn't look like there's adjustable arms on it just from where the wheels are sitting in the fender well so maybe that's why um that's like first clue to me just by looking at it it's like a good side profile picture um you know and it's just one of those things like one guy goes is it caster did he mean camber you know so like those are all good questions asked too um you know, it's just yeah, because so let's talk about camber and caster real quick for yeah. anybody who doesn't know what's going Can you give on. So, a quick explanation for so on a solid axle Jeep, you, if your axle is your tire is exactly perpendicular to your axle, you would have zero camber. Okay, if the top of the tire leans in towards the center line of the Jeep, that's negative camber. If it leans out away from the Jeep, that's positive camber. Okay, how you get camber in a solid axle vehicle is something bends, the axle bends. Um, the the end of the axle at the at the C where the uh, ball joints are can can bend. You can have bad ball joints because yeah, you can, <clears throat> can you can't bend a ball joint, can you? Is that like what? Could you tweak? You, you can. I'm sure you, you can could bend in them. Yes. Whatever situation. Usually they snap, but but you can fatigue you can, them. Yeah. You can also have bad. So Jeeps have unit bearings. They have one piece wheel bearings, yeah. but those can wear out and give you a little bit. But Look at that dude that snapped vary. two ball joints. That's true. I mean, you know, like anything could happen. That's the one thing that. I've but realized that's to with me, this. like when I see something like that, that's what I would assume would happen versus bending it. Yeah, right. it's like a hardened piece. Usually they snap, but I mean, we don't. We we've seen everything. Can it be caused just by severely worn parts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. you can just have severely worn ball joints, right? Yeah. And then so the top of the tire leans out, or the top of the tire leans in, depending on how it's sitting. Um, Usually, if you have bad unit bearing or something, you'll get you'll get some real bad cupping on your tires, and you'll actually, if you measure your camber and then you pull forward, so your tire moves 180 degrees, you measure it again, it's usually different, right? Because you're getting a wobble versus you know something that's bent and staying at a specific degree. Um, now, <clears throat> that's camber. So camber, if you have camber on your Jeep, and I forget what spec is, anywhere from a quarter to what is it, Half qu quarter to, like to quarter that. degree toe negative camber, I think is around what the, the spec one. would be and it's okay um because realistically you're gonna have you're gonna have 
as much as it like the most minute amount of play in that wheel bearing, right? That wheel bearing's never going to stay perfectly straight up and down. There's going to be a little bit of slop in that. There's going to be a little bit. Of, I mean, you have like this big tire on there. You almost want a little bit because if it were to be perfectly straight, I would assume it would have some weird driving tendencies. I mean, look at like this is extremes, but a race car that has three degrees of camber on both front tires that's for cornering you know like sure would you get some weird instability i don't think there's anything wrong with having um with having zero camber on your jeep um the problem is is that as parts wear and you start develop if you if or if you, something happens where you develop a little bit of positive camber mm -hmm. then that's undesirable um so you want it, you know, they, they favor it zero to, to a quarter of negative, right? That's why they're favoring it yeah. that way from the factory. Now, caster is the different thing, right? Think of the rakes, the rake of a fork on a motorcycle, right? That's caster, right? So when you turn your motorcycle and you let go, it wants to snap that back to straight, right? So caster is, if you were to draw a line hypothetically through the center of both of your ball joints and where it intersects the ground, whatever that angle is, if you drew a line straight through them both, you know, it's like how laid back, right. how laid back that angle is. Right. And uh, am I saying it wrong? Positive caster is is forward, right? The way you don't want it to be. Yeah. I think negative caster is I think you're negative rolling, caster positive is the way caster, that you're, you're rolling the axle forward, right? Yeah. 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 Like you're almost trying to make the diff cover point to the ground. Yeah. So so ultimately on a Jeep, I don't know what factory is, five or six degrees. I think it's. I think it's actually five and a half or six. Five and a half or six degrees. So now what happens when you lift your vehicle, that axle, the, that, that between the line you just drew between those ball joints, as you lift your vehicle, that stands up straight. Okay, so now you have no caster. Now your vehicle's all over the road. You can't keep the thing going straight down the road, right? It's like a shopping cart. So that's why lift kits come with adjustable control arms. Bare minimum, upper adjustable control arms, right? Yeah. And then that way you can twist those arms and shorten them and bring that baby back down to where you have caster again and you can drive it. But then what happens? Then your your diff, your yoke is pointed straight or down and your drive shaft goes up at a sharp angle and now you have vibration in your drive shaft, right? So there's all these games we have to play to keep, keep these things correct. Now, in an off-road suspension kit for your Jeep, you get what you pay for. If you go buy a cheap kit on Amazon, somewhere else rough country is one of the fairly cheap ones um you kind of get what you pay for those guys didn't spend a lot of time doing a lot of geometry and making sure that your shit was going to be perfect when you were done you go buy an evo kit well those guys just spent a lot of time and money engineering making sure that you have all the parts you need to relocate your track bars or do whatever you need to do to get all that stock geometry back to where it was before so that even though you have a lift your vehicle is going to drive like like it did before you had the lift. Yeah. So when we were reading through some of the comments on this, there was a whole bunch of misinformation. And that misinformation is a real bummer because um, if, if that person's out there taking all this in, one, they've got to decipher what they think is good information <laughs> and bad information. And so if they go, well, I heard this the most, so this must be the right answer. Well, the stuff that was commented on the most was not the right answer, right? But there's more than one way to skin the cat, right? So you've just got to understand how the stuff works so that you know you you can you can make it right. So maybe that alignment shop was correct, but um, to, to, they could potentially put in offset ball joints and it would be fine. Um, I would ask the customer, what do you do with your Jeep? You know, do you just drive it up and down PCH with the top off and have a good time and you're not worried about the performance of it's off-road capability. Okay, well, then maybe the ball joints is the way to go for you. It's a cheap, effective way to do that. Or, no, I'm going to go do John Bull, and then I'm going to do the Rubicon next year. Okay, well, that's... We need to tailor it to that. We need to fix this in a different way so that we don't fatigue parts when you're out on the trail and break them. Um, so I just... my I guess what I'm trying to say is be careful when you post something like that and start reading all the comments. Um, we're more than happy for you to call us. Um, we actually do that quite a bit. Like yeah, talk to people, even just people that come in off the streets. Oh, I saw your sign off the freeway. You know, hey, my Jeep drives weird. You know, what do you think about it or whatever? But yeah, it's it's always super cool to educate people on just as what I mean. This is a very specific vehicle, as far as I'm concerned. Like this and some old Toyotas and some Fords are pretty much the only thing that 
you know, are yeah. currently like not independent front suspension and like have these characteristics, you know? Yeah. That, um, and that's the other thing too, right? Is that a, an alignment shop is going to say, you bring them in a YJ that's got leaf spring suspension and they're going to say, well, I can set your toe and that's it. And yeah. you're get out of here. Right. That's all I can do for you. Um, and in their case, it is true, right? Because they've got different liabilities and different things that they deal with and, and that's all they can fix. But I'm sure you can go down. Like I put myself in the, in the situation of the tech, like you can go down such a rabbit hole of being an alignment guy. And like somebody comes in with a, like a different vehicle every day and it's like, okay, well, how do I fix the alignment on this one? Like I got to do this, this, and this, and this. And then for him, you know, he's trying to tell the customer, well, you could do this, you know, and he just throws something out there because he did that like a week ago on some other vehicle where to us, like, no, this is a Jeep, like a specifically a JK. Like there's other ways of getting around that, that, that don't have to do with this. Like I was even just looking at the comments now and some guy throws up a link to a steering system for metal cloak, from metal cloak, like what? tie rod and drag link setup. I'm like, that has nothing to do with any of this conversation. Right. Yeah, that's... What are the odds that this said alignment shop is uh, more like a car specific place? A hundred percent. I mean, that's a, this guy a says big... this guy says reputable shop, but is that like, hey, my reputable? I've been go Repu reputable? Rep reputable. reputable, reputable. Sorry, reputable. I could not. Reputable. Reputable. They've repeated it several times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've repeated I, it. I mean, I just think that that's like an interesting point. That like, yeah. you, what's the the saying that you, you can't. I, it may be a, I won't even butcher it, but like, well, no, but it may be a trusted shop to like your friend that has a Camry, you yeah. know, like they've been going there for years. Everything's good. Yeah, it could just be that local. Town. That's, yeah. that's a, that's a good shop. Like, guy, Hey, I've been taking my car to get serviced here all the time. But to somebody that's like specifically going to a shop with a Jeep on 37s and like it's needs to get an alignment, like they're not, they, yeah, they could figure it out for sure. Anybody can. I wouldn't want them to. It's such a different application <laughs> yeah. that it's not necessarily about like, oh, you don't have any, you know, experience or anything. That guy might have done, you know, thirty seven thousand alignments on Camrys, right? Awesome. Yeah. He can do it with his eyes closed. But you have to know how to ask the right questions, you know? And for sure. That's a big part of it. You have to know what the application is and it's totally different. It's not the same at all, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> Yeah, and and, and <clears throat> Like Jake was saying, we do, people call us and people come in and we talk them through it. And I guess what I'm trying to say is don't hesitate to do that. Like I don't, we, we, have, we want you to call us. Even if I don't do the work for you and we just give you the information and you and your buddy use that information to go home and align it in your garage at night. Like I will teach you how to do an alignment on your Jeep. I don't, I don't, there's no, I, I would much rather everybody understand how everything works and know and be educated on it than get taken advantage of or make not necessarily get taken advantage some places will take advantage of you but but use bad information to make a bad decision about your jeep because it will cost you a lot of money it's not just like oh i you know yeah. i messed this up it's like no now you're fixing what you already spent parts on already had you know labor installed now you have to redo it like that it's money you know it's not mm -hmm. just time yeah yeah, and we've done in the past, we've done some pre-trip and post-trip inspection classes here where I teach you how to check ball joints and things like that. I, I would really love to revamp that and start doing that again. Um, but I think what would be easier than inviting everybody here to teach you how to do it is make some really good YouTube videos yeah. and teach everybody how to do it just on a YouTube video. That way you can practice it at home. And, and then after you that's the one place you should make the comment right you watch my video on how to do an alignment on your jeep and you have a question make a comment so that i can you know respond in that you know comment stream on the on youtube that way all the good information's in one spot um and then if there's some local people who do want to come by and actually be hands-on then you know obviously i would love to do that on a you know weekend or something i i would work for hamburgers or whatever you bring food wise Jersey uh, Mike's. It's very food motivated. Everybody. Yeah, Carl's food motivated. Junior. Ice cream sandwiches. Oh, man. I'll do it. Um, no even like did. a fruit bowl, you know? Nice fruit bowl. Yeah. Mm. We had another Jeep in here today and an older Y. It was a YJ, right? Yes. And it had some conversion in it. Some older Chevrolet axle was put in the front. And it's the kind of axle that has the spring perch molded into the center housing. Um, kind of like the Scouts had back in the day. And. And the only way to really fix those is because it's leaf spring is to, you, you know, you can put a, a wedge 
under there, but I mean, the wedge is only so much, and this vehicle had like zero caster. So the only real way to fix this is to cut and turn it. And that's where we cut the end of the axle off and we rotate it and re-weld it back on so that you have caster. And that's a real time consuming, expensive process. So, you know, it's, it's a bummer. I feel bad for the customer because he purchased the vehicle and, and was unaware of that. And now he's got this vehicle that's got this issue and we're trying to help him figure it out. But, um, you did say you took it to several other shops and they've thrown tons of parts at it. Yeah. He replaced like everything under that thing. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that we're on the right track of figuring out what it is because it's got, you know, just like a lot of the YJs and CJs. It's like, yep, got a small block Chevy. And so he's like looking at all this stuff again on the forums. Um, people saying that the power steering pump is putting out too much pressure and it's too, you know, it's too much pressure and it's causing the steering to be super twitchy. And maybe that is the case for some of them. But this one just straight up has zero caster. Right. Zero. Yeah. And it's, I mean, alignment is a big deal on a Jeep. And worn parts is a big deal on a Jeep. Um, and getting the right parts to prevent, <clears throat> I mean, you know, when you go to a, a Jeep, what's a Jeep come with stock tire size? Um, depending on the package, anywhere, be yeah, between like a 265 and a. So let's talk I about a Sport, right? Not a Rubicon yeah, yeah. that's coming with the Dana 44, but say a Sport. Probably like 31s or 32s. They're pretty small. Yeah, they're all, the smaller. all the Rubicons are 33s. Yeah, yeah so, we, so say a 31 for a sport, right? Or whatever their metric equivalent is, you know, whatever yeah. that, that is. And that thing has a specific amount of leverage and force on your suspension, right? When you're going around the corner and all the vehicle weight transfers to that tire and that side, those ball joints and everything have a certain amount of pressure put on them, right? And then you get 37s on there. Even guys that are putting 40s on these things, like yeah, relatively like stock, just a lift. Like, no, we're going straight 38s or 39s or 40s. Sounds yeah. good. It's got so much leverage. It's a giant. Your tire is a giant fulcrum just trying to fuck your suspension up. Yeah. And so when you go big, you've got to beef everything up in order to make it work right. Um, so that's another thing that we see a lot of is is big tires and not enough adequate you know, suspension bolstering to keep everything from getting wrecked. Didn't, fast. didn't we weigh one of your 37s one time with the wheel on it? Wasn't yeah. it like 130 pounds? No, it was more than that. It was like 213 pounds. Something no like that. Way. That really puts stuff into perspective. Not that one, That's one wheel and tire. As much as I weigh. Yeah. That I'm much. pretty confident that it was like, because we also weighed a customer's tire that was off, and his was like a few pounds heavier than his. And it was just a 37, but different tire, different wheel. 200 pounds sounds like way too much, though. Yours is out one, there. We'll measure it tomorrow one, one and come 40. back to this. See, your wheels and tires, if you're running 37s, could be anywhere between 150 and 200 pounds. And then when it's rotating, now you got rotating mass. Oh, if yeah. you want to do all the math on rotating mass, it's even worse, That's right? a lot, dude. So there's a lot of inertia. Um, oh, God, 40. Not a 47, <laughs> 37. <laughs> um, so, so I don't know. I mean, what... We're also chasing a, a, you know, we're chasing an issue on Brian's Jeep. And That's a weird one. That's a this, really weird one. This is a Jeep where wasn't wheeled hard. But it is a heavily modified. It's JK. heavily modified. It's got an Evo kit on one of the early Evo kits, like way back. 2013 is when this Jeep was built. Double throwdown. It's got a, their long arm kit. It's got. It's a badass Jeep. Yeah, it's triple bypass super, super, in the front. Very nicely built by them too. Um, that was probably back in the heyday of them first coming out with that kid, I would assume. Or probably. At least I mean, 2013. Early days of it. So now that it's been around a while, um, it's got a left pull. And that thing just it doesn't just matter what you do to that vehicle, it pulls left. I mean, I could, we've exaggerated all of the alignment specs on it so that it should have a Ooh, severe right hand not a lot pull. Of information on this, to be honest with you. And it pulls go. left. So. Yeah, that's like a, a whole other conversation itself. It's just the, the variables that exist in not just alignment related conversation, but any just diagnostic of anything like this, right? That yeah. like that's why it is so important to take it to a person that knows what they're doing, right? Because like an Evo kit, right? You can have already done the lift, wheels, tires, or whatever, and install some other type of you know very popular kit. And there's one part that was just ever so slightly machined improperly or something that yeah. causes a large issue and it's like just those type of things that like diagnostic work right it's like yeah you you can have you could take that to anybody else and they'll say oh you need a whole new kit right or you yep. take to someone who's 
you know, very familiar with it. And they'll say, oh, no, you should. Or I don't want to touch it at all. Like, you know. Yeah, exactly. Because that happens a lot where these people take these these modified Jeeps that they just bought. You know, they saw it on Marketplace. And like the one dude with the Hemi, that tan one that we work on. Oh, yeah. That dude got a smoking deal on that thing. Not to say that he didn't know much about Jeeps. was just. Hey, dude! I saw this badass Jeep had a Hemi swap in it. Bought it, Enthusiastic you know. About it. Yeah, wrong and with it's that? like, okay, well, this is wrong with it. This is, oh man, like still, yeah. still on the good side of things, you know. He's not like totally blown out of proportion of like, you know, way out of budget for the car. But it's like, I, I really wish more people would do like pre-vehicle inspections. You know, I worked at a, uh, I worked at a Porsche shop, and it was basically all classic Porsches. There was very, very few that were newer than you know. The, the air-cooled era, which was like 90s, 95, 94, something like that. Um, but we had people probably on a weekly basis that would be buying these cars, and they would pay however much it was, 150 bucks to have a pre-purchase inspection. And I don't know why people don't do why, that. You know, maybe, it's, maybe we don't advertise that enough. Or maybe people just don't think about it. Do you think people are like scared that asking for that implies yeah. they like have to buy it or whatever? Shady's going on. A lot, a lot yeah. of like people that are selling their cars don't like when you ask them if they can take your car well, somewhere. Well, that's and weird to at, me. Which is to me, I've always explained that to people too. That that's a huge red flag. If the person's like, I don't want you taking my car to a shop to get looked at, don't buy that car. Yeah. That means they're hiding something from you for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it totally makes sense. But you know, the guys that I worked with, they're super knowledgeable with those vintage Porsches and it was like right off the bat it was like yep this thing needs bushings bearings are need an adjustment you know one of the shocks is blown out and you know it needs a valve job it's leaking from the crankcase or whatever like those things always had oil leaks and uh all, all of a sudden this guy's like cool now I know if I buy this thing I gotta put you know six thousand dollars into it or whatever it was yeah. you know to get the engine resealed or you know whatever the case may be and it was worth it or it wasn't worth it you know hey this thing's a bastard child it's got fiber it's got you know fiberglass on fenders we saw some weird shit with those things because there were so many models and like people would just like graft on fiberglass extended fenders but if you looked at the car it would look like it was like a factory thing but there was so much bondo under it that like you couldn't tell you, you gotta know? bring the magnet uh-huh yeah. <laughs> and uh you know with the porsche market it's not like a jeep where you're, you know you're spending 20 30 40 thousand dollars like these are almost six figure cars some of them you know 80 60 yeah. 120 like this is big money shit that these people were dealing with so it's like i would totally spend a couple hundred bucks to have somebody look at this and make sure yep yeah. we're all we're all good send it <laughs> yeah definitely don't be afraid to bring your bring a jeep to a shop to have it checked out before you buy it yeah or just at least have a friend that knows what they're talking about yeah or, or if you're if you're uncertain bring a friend with you that might know a bit more that may yeah. be able to help you it's it's huge to but the other thing that i like all i think all of us here have bought in plenty of things before like even when you go and buy something that's used and it's got x amount of miles on it it's from the 90s it's from whenever like you go look at it and you're kind of like you can almost be jaded by like you're just excited oh yeah to, like, absolutely see it. <laughs> And Every then, purchase I've yeah. ever made. <laughs> and, and then you get it home and you're like, you're like, oh, I'm going to wash this thing. You know, you're all stoked to get it. You wash it and you're like, oh, it looks like somebody resprayed that. Oh, it looks like this. is. Oh, God. Oh, or even like, you know, what did I buy? You know, <laughs> or even just driving home. You're just like cruising home in it and you're excited. And then once you calm down, you're like, what did I, I don't do? remember if I even put this thing in four wheel drive to see if that worked. Uh huh. You know, Dude, yeah. the, can we talk about that? The the high effect that you oh, get going you to buy so a car. Oh, super excited. When you are a car or truck or whatever enthusiast. The high that overcomes your body that just makes you go just fucking buy. Just you know? dopamine. All the money That's out. Exactly yeah. how I felt buying my blue Jeep because the guy strategically took perfect pictures of it to make it look really really nice. And I drove like two and a half hours to go get it. Yeah. And I got there and as you could ask my wife, as I was pulling into the guy's neighborhood, I was like, I just really have never seen a passenger side picture of this Jeep before. <laughs> like ever. And then she was like, what? And then we pulled up, like just <laughs> barely missed his house. And it was in the driveway backed in and they could see like the way the sunlight was hitting the side of it. The passenger side was just wrinkled. And I was like, oh no. How do people do that though? I could never sell a vehicle. Dude, I, I, it was a good price, and I talked to the guy, and he was super honest, and like I never processed it. I was like, this thing like super clean, like I'm in, like I'm cool with buying it, and I drove all the way up there because you know the typical like I've got like five other people that want to come look at it, so you better be here early. So I was at his house yeah, at, like yeah. six thirty in the morning, and I was like, well, I drove this far. 
Might you, as guys, well. you guys got to do like I do. I only buy shit boxes. Because I know exactly what I'm getting. Yeah. I go up and I go, look, I got a thousand bucks. You're doing the work on it, so yeah, who like, cares what it needs? It's a shit box. Just yeah. tell me everything. I mean, if it, 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 I mean, I can't just, I mean, I don't really think I have a track record of buying nice things. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, in the end, too, you end up finding out where, like, if someone's unknowledgeable about the car they already own, too, you could see where they're like, I don't know anything about it. Yeah, it's got dents in it. Oh, well. But then you start looking at it and you're like, oh, well, it's got this. That's cool. If it's got this, that's cool. And that's what was the leading thing for me. It was like, well, it's beat up. I'm not stoked about that. But it's also like <clears throat> solid. Yeah. So it's not take always care. like visual things that you can see, though, which is the scary part. Like, yeah. that's oh, yeah. Like part of wiring it, dude. behind like, the dash. Like somebody put in a radio. Yeah. Oh, like hot just rods. stupid dude. stuff like hot that. Hot rods. Hot rods. Yeah. Oh. Forget that. Hot I rods. would love to tear apart any car that goes across the Barrett Jackson line. Oh, my God. Just I would not love even it, to tear it apart. Just take like the six screws to hold the, the gauges yeah. in. <laughs> and that's it. Like, oh, that'll man. tell me how much this car is actually worth right there. Yeah. I saw that a lot with my past job. Um, guys, you know, older gentlemen's buying cars on, you know, whatever any of those Mico hot rod tra- uh, like websites and just getting them off ebay and you know this beautiful car shows up and they bring it into you to to look at it after they purchase it and you put yeah. it up on the rack and you're just like oh no and you take like anything apart inside of it and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and then they're upset they just spent 60 grand on a car and then they're mad at you because you got to spend another 60 grand on the car to get it right <laughs> like it's hot rods are the worst yeah. people hide so much in those cars and just throw a pretty paint job on them and yeah yeah. That's a very disguisable thing, I think, for a hot rod. That that's like as far as the whole like woo factor that you oh, get when yeah. you look at something Especially and you you're open just, up the hood, you see a big so, old yeah. motor in there, you get all stoked, you put, the guy fires it up, like, yeah. yeah, dude, take it for a ride, go ahead. You, you put, you get all be, stoked. The key to selling a hot rod, loud mufflers, chrome valve covers. And a pretty paint job. Sold. Dude, you every sold. time. Open up the hood and see a clean engine bay. There could be no pistons in those cylinders. And <laughs> yeah, you'd be like, yeah. Stoked. You know? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's easy. I, I think Jeeps are a little harder to be shady with that kind of stuff. Especially because you can uh, crawl around under them. Yeah, it's so easy yeah. to roll underneath you them. You know? Like, I, when I bought my first old BMW, it was a 1993 series. And I went to Encinitas, test drove it. I think a day later, I came back with money and bought it. I remember driving home and I'm going down the 78 and I get stuck in traffic. And I'm like, what's that smell? What's that sound? What's that, <laughs> what's that smell? That's a different smell. Dude, the clutch was bad on it. The power steering started leaking like the next day. The rack and pinion was blown out. Like all the bushings needed to be replaced. And the thing had like a muffler on it and it had the, the BMW stripes on the fender. And I got obviously stoked on that. But other than that, it was like grandma's car three series, you know? But I was just so caught up and like, yeah, dude, it's got stripes on the fender. Like, this thing's a race car, practically. <laughs> like, sign me up, dude. Here's the money. It's it's easy on like a JK because you can crawl underneath it and you can see that the rear exhaust and the fuel tanker caved in, and you can go, dude, you wheeled the shit out of this. Yeah. No, no, no. I just went down some fire roads and yeah, right. Yeah. The frames got yeah. scratched, gouges in it and stuff. You can tell. Dude, I was so prepped when I bought my JK because I went to a Honda dealership in Temecula and it was like super bright red. So obviously like flashy factor and it's already lifted, already on 37. So I went up there, I looked at it and then a couple days later I came back with my mom because if I bought it, I had, you know, had to get it home and had to get it right up there. And so I'm like picking this thing apart. I'm like... Drive shaft in the front is blown out. There's grease everywhere. Like you could hear it rattling. Like there was all this stuff wrong with it. It was all dented on one area. And like there's engine oil leaking. There's this, that, the other. Like I'm like the ball joints are busted. And so I'm like talking to the salesman about this. And I'm like, dude, this thing needs ball joints. All the steering sloppy. Like everything's sloppy You're on this You're a salesman's thing. nightmare, by the oh, way. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there and he goes, no, no, no. I talked to my tech. He actually said these don't have ball joints. My mom goes, <laughs> "My mom goes, you're not going to win this argument. He <laughs> works at a Jeep shop and he builds these things all day. Like Point he knows case. what's wrong with it, you know? And <laughs> the guy just looks at me and goes, let me see what I can do about the price. <laughs> that's and, that's, and that's the thing, right? It's like the salesman has two choices right there. Either decide it's worth it to fix everything for you, or just say forget it and sell it to the next poor soul, right? Yeah. yeah. So it just sucks that they pull that card too because they're like, oh, if I tell this kid it doesn't have ball joints, he's gonna be like, oh yeah, I I read that once. You're yeah. right. You know, yeah. and then that that person's gonna get it, and then they're gonna end up with you know problems down the road, and that sucks. Like, yeah. just be honest. Well, no, nah, dude. In that yeah. world, it's I hate to say it, it's, but it's so yeah. sleazy. 
the the biggest one that I get, I mean, I know we're going off track here, but like the biggest one that I get even buying a used car, a new car, all of them is when they put the protective film on your car and they charge you like $700 for it. That's like 20 or maybe a hundred dollars worth of parts and labor for them. If they do it, if they do it, which okay. it, it's like a quarter inch film on the end of the door so that when you open it up against a wall, it doesn't chip the paint. And then the other one's like behind the grab handle, like underneath so that your nails don't scratch the paint. Like that's it, dude. Somebody literally spent 20 minutes to put that stuff on and they try and charge you seven or 800 bucks for it. It's a, it's a no brainer for them. Yeah. And then on top of that, they go, oh, we're putting this alarm system in or this tracking system so that you always know where this car is and it's all covered under this or that or the other. It's like, dude, it's literally just plugged into your OBD and like you can unplug it and go here. I don't want this. Like take it back, you know? And then I forget what the other one was. Sometimes they'll say that there's tin on the car, even though it's factory tint. They'll go, no, we had somebody come out and tin it. They try to do that to my mom and she goes, I could see right through it. Like, no, I'm not paying for that, you know, and I'm literally going to go take it to a place to go have it tinted by my own place. Yeah. You know, like take that off there. When I worked at a motorhome dealership as a tech, they, we, one of the things we had to do on every vehicle that came in, that was a new vehicle that was going to inventory is we had to install, they were like a lot security. And so we would put them underneath the dash and we would install them and you had to have this key fob that you would wave in the right spot, and it would go boop, boop, and then you could start it, right? Like well, it was the Fords, out. right? Yeah, just like Ford? what my Ford has, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we were putting those on every single, and it was for inventory security, right? It was so that unless you had a key fob, you couldn't start the thing and drive it away. Um, but then we didn't want to take them out. So as part of the sale, the salesman would say, oh, and we can install this security system for you, which is really cool, and blah, 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 and then customer would say, yeah, I want that, or whatever, and, well, it's already there, right? So it's, they're just selling something that's already there. And all they had to do is sell, like, one, and then all of them we put on for that whole week were, you know. Paid for. Paid for. So I get wow. it. From a business standpoint, it's it's yeah. good, right? Right? They're like, hey, we've got to do this for lot security, but we, if we sell one or two of them a month, then they get all paid for, and it's only good, it's good for the customer because we would, we would, uh, we had our universal fob that they were all programmed for, but then as soon as the customer bought it, they got their own set of fobs and we'd reprogram it to their, you know, their, their unique key fob. But I mean, I get it. I, I get it on that side of it. Right. Like they're upsells, upsells, It's upsell, a hustle, right? dude. It's all, it, it comes down to it. It's a hustle. Yeah. Of, it's a hustle of the business, you know, it's just not, you know, it's like everything at the dealership. It's just so overpriced. Yeah. yeah. If it makes you feel any better from working in the dealership world for quite a few years prior to this i've definitely watched some salesmen you know get got if you will yeah i had a a situation one time where you know kind of like we were talking about earlier like working in the motorcycle industry if we were going to buy a bike from somebody at the time when i was working in the service department i was very adamant about let me look at it let let me at least schedule one of my texts just even 15 minutes just yeah just go over it who cares like just it doesn't because you're gonna, taking it on trade, right? It's not going to cost the sales department anything for us to look at it. You yeah. Know, or maybe it gets billed internally and it's not, it's a drip it's in a, the bucket, right? It's a washout. And they often would be so impatient that they would just refuse. They would be so certain that they knew what they were talking about that they would take a bike in either on trade or they'd buy it off someone and just get reamed, dude. I had a, one time someone brought in like a brand new Kawasaki. It was like that you know, the, the newest year, latest, greatest, 450 or whatever. This is several years ago now. And the salesman was so stoked that he had, like, wheeled and dealed this guy. And he paid him, really, honestly, a lot of money for it, even if it yeah. was in perfect condition, and refused to let us look at it. So the deal's done. We take it back to the service department. And uh, the <laughs> the oil drain plug is pretty much super glued into the case. <laughs> Someone had tried to put a, a Healy coil on it, but the hole was like so blown out, if oh. you will, that it the Healy coil wouldn't even help. So they literally like tried to RTV it. That didn't help. So they super glued it and just shoved it in there and, and waited for it to it dry. No. And we paid this guy top dollar for it. <laughs> and now the whole case is, <laughs> like, is jacked. Oh, yeah. Like... The case was cracked. I mean, it was, we, we, I think, ended up upside down on it, you know? And it's like, oh, yeah. man, guys, super weird how that happened, huh? Yep. Like, you know, so if it makes you feel any better, it happens on the other end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dealer gets got, got too. Oh, yeah. Like, I've heard stories of people putting, like, uh, you know, like your transmission starts slipping and 
you put Ooh. like some additive in it and it, it helps it not slip. I heard a Just story of, in. of a guy that did that and he dumped a hole. And it was like a pretty clean, I think it was like a Ford Ranger or a Chevy 1500. I can't remember which one it was. Literally just filled up that thing, had it towed near the dealership, got out and like drove it to the dealer, which was like a mile at that point, traded it in, everything was good, running fine, you know, and a week later. And they gave him top dollar for that thing too. Got his new truck that he wanted, drove off, everything was good, deal's done. Hey man, sorry, I don't know what happened. Transmission slipping now, that's not my problem. I didn't know it was slipping, mm -hmm. you test drove it, you know. Yeah. This is why I have trust issues. <laughs> For sure the automotive world will 110% make you have trust issues. Like, Just know, everybody out there, when you come to Ben, I'm going to tell you exactly how it is. Yeah. On that note, too, though, like, I, I must commend you for, like, when you do put it out there that, like, if you want to call, if you want to ask us questions, whether it's Curtis that picks up the phone or you or me sometimes that we're super willing to help people, I think that that's rad because I don't know about anybody else, but like I said, like, my small amount of experience in the service world is that, that it's a huge no-no. Like It's a huge no-no. I do a lot of things that are uh, not allowed no in the automotive industry. Um, I go against the grain. I don't believe in the way things are done, so we do it different. Uh, you definitely are not. If you called any other service shop around, they would say, bring it in, we'll check it out. Bring it in, we'll check it out. Bring it in, we'll check it out, right? Yeah. Whereas I'm willing to talk you through it, and if you decide you want me to work on it, then I'll work on it, right? It, yeah, but even your your version of bringing it in and we'll check it out, you still are so much more honest than like any other shop. Yeah, I mean, bring it in. I mean, if we get to the conclusion on our phone call where it's like, you just bring it in, you know, we're going to do a free inspection for you, okay? So right out of the gate, just if we do get to the point where like, okay, bring it in. I, I, I can't diagnose this anymore over the phone. I've got to see the Jeep. Bring it in. We're going to look at it. We're going to tell you exactly what we think it is. And you can tell me, okay, cool, thanks, bye. And you can go home and you and your buddy can fix it. I don't care. I mean... That's so unheard of. <laughs> like I, yeah, I mean, not, it's, it's super unheard of. Not, not that I don't care about you or your, your Jeep. I don't, I don't care what you do with the information. If you want me to fix it, I'll fix it. If you're savvy and you want to fix it, then you fix it, right? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I, you, you could nickel and dime it all day long to try and get that, try and get that push, try and get that, that one, you know, couple hour job. Here, you know, we got paid a couple hours for this, and like, it's not. I don't think it's worth. How should I say that? It's not it's, worth the return. It's not worth the return because, like, we had one lady. I forget what it was, but she, like, came by one day, and uh, she was hearing this clunking sound. It was like a bolt that came out of her shock, and the shock was just clanking around. So I have a parts bin that has a whole bunch of, like, factory JK or JL bolts in it. Found one that worked, threw it in there, tightened it up, and, like, hey, you're good to go. Are you sure? Do you want money for it? It's like, no, dude, it's a bolt, and it took me four seconds to figure it out and put it in. I'll get you on the next one if you decide to come back ever. Yeah. That's but if And if you don't, so be it. And I just have a good karma thing, I guess, that I help somebody easily. You know, like it took five minutes out of my day. You're all good, you know. And if they come back and decide to go, yeah, I want to put wheels and tires on it, then cool. That works. You know, like what comes around goes around in that sense. And like I don't think you're going to like prosper in that industry if you're like, yeah, dude, give me 100 bucks for that. We have a shop minimum. Sorry. It's 70 bucks. You know, which I'm sure somebody lady would pay to just have a clunking sound go away, but it's it's not worth it. It's really not. No, and in the end, it's always just that. It, even it's just that peace of mind, it's like you're saying. At least you get to, you know, you're stoked that that person's stoked because it took you five minutes to help them, and they're like insanely grateful about it. Yeah, and you didn't really do anything besides just make their day better. And that yeah, person's going to go out of their way now to refer at least five different people. Oh, to, absolutely! Oh my yeah. God, this service that I experienced was insane. Like, yeah. you know, like it's just it's so worth it just yeah. in this industry to set yourself apart by just being a good person. It's not yeah. that hard, yeah. you know. Like, yeah, we have we have tons of people that are starting to travel from deep down south and from Temecula and all over the place. I mean, it's just like the couple that we helped with the LJ which you which they which is rad I love it and thank you everybody for supporting us and coming as far as you do to be with us but I'm sorry also at the same time that whoever is in your local area has treated you so bad that you're willing to drive all the way to me because that's that's what makes me sad is that the people in my industry are not taking care of and there are some shops out there that do take care of people. We're not yeah. the only one. It's there a bummer because, I mean, you get people that call all the time, and you're like, man, I would love to just recommend you somewhere that's close by your house instead of making you drive 
two hours up here to sit in traffic. Yeah. I mean. But I do have two big screens in the lobby. So Netflix, Hulu, whatever. You can watch whatever you want. There's a dog. <laughs> There's we a, a bar. Car, we got a Carlos here. <laughs> that just love you up. So, I mean, it's kind of worth it. You know? Yeah. It's a worth the trip. All right. Well, let's let's not uh, go down that road anymore. Let's talk about, let's go back to some technical stuff. Um, we've kind of covered the alignment issues uh, that we see. Um do we shoot? So let's talk about thrust because I, I think sometimes people ignore the back of their Jeep a little bit and don't realize that there's adjustment back there. Um, so like the front, the back, when you do a lift, will we'll have pinion angle problems, so the drive mm-hmm. shaft. So again, they put adjustable arms on the back, right? So ideally you want your axle perpendicular to your chassis, right? Mm-hmm. And thrust is that rear axle and which way it's facing. Is it crooked in there and it's kind of aiming both tires to the driver's side a little bit or driving, aiming both tires to the passenger side a little bit? So that's axle thrust. And if you don't get those arms in correctly, and sometimes on Jeeps, especially Jeeps that have been off-roaded, you know, you're putting this kit together on your workbench and it says start with all your control arms at 24.25 inches long, center to center, right? And you put them in, and you know they're equal, but your Jeep drives wacky down the road, right? you gotta, you got to turn into it and keep it. So it's dog tracking is what we call it, right? You've got to know how to go in and measure so that you can adjust those arms to, one, give you the good pinion angle, but also to keep the thrust in line with your chassis, right? Yeah. And sometimes that doesn't mean make, making them equal on either side because you've got you've to adjust according to... You know, brackets on your Jeep that have stretched or pulled or bent or yeah. whatever, right? Sorry um, not to interrupt you, but that's a super valid point. Just what we were talking about earlier with, like, the all kinds of variables and taking it to someone who has experience. So many you variables with that. Think about, like, what separates, you know, like, someone who does off-road specific stuff to, like, a regular mechanic that sees more cars and stuff. These are vehicles that not only have you made super duper not stock anymore, but you essentially abuse, right? Like, that's just the truth. For sure. You neglect a little bit and you abuse a lot that's just a fact right like there's more wear and tear on a jeep and various other types of off-road vehicles that have caused different Mm -hmm. scenarios right like that being one of them yeah absolutely we get customers i mean we have a a good chunk of customers that you know they'll get a crew with their buddies and they go drive all the way up to the rubicon do the rubicon drive all the way back they go drive out to moab like we had one guy that went to montana and drove all the way down from Montana to New Mexico, like nonstop off road. It was, I don't know how many thousands of miles, but like, and we just put a kit on that thing. And he had some things that he was, that he wanted to improve on and other things he was super stoked on, didn't want to touch, but it's like, okay, cool. Fine tuned. You went from having this like shitty lift kit and we changed it, got a whole better setup. He went out and did this trip. Cool, man. Po- like keep your keynotes on what, you know, what yeah. you want and what you need and we'll get it on the next round. And like, these people, that thing had 10,000 miles on it, and the original lift was a ready shot. <laughs> like, because it was like 10,000 off-road miles. Like hard yeah, he, miles, he you know? only uses that truck for off-road. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and it's heavy. It's got a bunch of weight on it. So, like, it's easy for that stuff to go out of whack. I mean, even when you think about it, if you have a hole that the bolt goes through to attach the arm, if you push the axle and tighten that bolt, and on the other side you pull that axle and tighten that bolt, there's slop in there. That may not be a lot, but maybe on the outside, by the time you get to the outside of the tire, it's an eighth of an inch. Mm-hmm. That's a difference, you know? Like every single one of those things, I've seen holes wallered out because the the bolt came loose at some point. It kept just kept slopping, oh, yeah. slopping, slopping, and it's like, that's easy enough, you know? That'll throw everything off. Um, and even those kits, when they say, hey, we recommend you start at this length, that's recommended that you start at that length realistically it's yeah it's a starting point it'll get you close maybe it'll be okay maybe it won't be yeah. you know <laughs> like i don't know how many times i've like put a kit together and then you put it on the ground you're like oh god that's not even close <laughs> i gotta turn that out like four turns you know yeah so. and and again on the front and rear as well we have axle um offset right so that's when your axle is exactly you want it perpendicular to the chassis but you also want it centered exactly under the chassis right and so your track bar is what does that front and rear. And usually on most really nice lift kits, they come with an adjustable track bar. 
The ones that are not as nice, they'll come with a drop down bracket or some relocation bracket that relocates your track bar to give to, to center it back up. But we like the adjustable ones because then we can dial it in. Literally fine. Yeah. Like and you can get it perfect, perfect. Yeah. Get your axle dead perfect centered under your, your chassis and then get your axle exactly perpendicular under the chassis, front and rear. Then we can set the toe and, you know, the thing will go down the road straight. Um, there, there are some other factors, you know, that you can talk about. Anybody out there who's got a Fox steering stabilizer, that's not the ATS style. That's not a pass-through shaft. That's just the old style that looks like a regular shock. Those things, if you take them off and you push on it and it doesn't stay collapsed and it slowly starts to go back out, that's going to give you force feedback in your steering. Because it's charged. It's because it's, it's charged. You, you bolted a shock to your and and not in like in a yeah damp, uh, not in a, a dampening way. It's more like a pressurized way. It almost yeah. Like, so we don't want your steering stabilizer to have any rebound at all, right? Yeah. And so I those mean, get on there, and people drive them, and they come in. Yeah, it's, it's a, I've had it aligned. I've had it worked on. I've had this, that, and the other. This thing, you know, I'm constantly goes. You know, what are, what are the windows are on there? Is it, it goes right too hard or left too hard? Yeah, it can't it'd, go right, it'd go right too hard. Yeah. yeah. I think it goes right too hard, and they're always correcting yeah, for it. it. It's essentially just supposed to be creating resistance, correct? Yeah. All it's supposed it. to do is take road noise out of your steering wheel. Yeah. But, That's I mean, as far as, like, the actual, like, mechanism, right? Like, it's just, yeah, just creating resistance, resistance yeah. in both directions. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a dampener like a regular shock is. If but you hit a pothole, it's going to make that pothole hit yeah, it's less, not gonna, it's gonna, less aggressive. It's yeah. not going to rip the steering wheel out of your hands. But so if you have one of those old Fox ones and you have drivability issues, I always recommend just take it off and drive it without it and see yeah. if it feels better. It's a good place to start. Just take it off and see what happens. You remember <laughs> the ones that have two shocks on them that face opposing? Yeah. Even that, oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> in all, however dumb that is, in my opinion, like it still is technically doing what the pass-through yeah, one is, right? You're having counteracting force, and it's, and those, it's and giving... And those are okay on, like, big trucks, like like a truck like yours, right? Like a big Ford diesel truck that's got a big old axle. You can get away with having a twin opposing shock on it. They don't, mm -hmm. They're not terrible. They work good for that. Um, on a Jeep, not More so More damping force, you know? Yeah. Like, when it comes down to it, why do you put a giant 4.0 you know, King triple bypass on a trophy truck. Exactly. More dampening force. We just don't like to use steering stabilizers to mask other problems because they will, they'll mask problems. So, um, so hopefully you can fix everything that's mechanically wrong. Alignment wise is wrong. And then once that's all done, then you put your stabilizer on. Like we do all of our alignments, no stabilizer, all of our test drives, uh, after the alignments, no stabilizer. And then when it's all the way we want it, then we bolt the stabilizer on. Yeah. That's like the last thing we do because it's inconsequential to um, everything as far as your alignment and everything else goes. It's just there for for that extra bit of, of comfort. So um, if you're doing alignments with your steering stabilizer hooked up, stop doing that. Unhook it and do your alignment. And then if it drives great and then you hook the steering stabilizer up and it drives like shit, there's your problem. It's probably got a fo <laughs> it's probably got a Fox one that's pressurized. I put yeah. that King one on one time, and that thing was like really charged. Yeah. Like super super charged, and I remember driving it, and I'm like, this is goofy, but I get it. Like he's got Kings everywhere else, so he wants to have a King stabilizer on it. I remember giving it to the guy, and like a week or two later, he came back, and he's like, yeah, I don't want that thing anymore. Can we take it off, put something else on. It's like, yes, good. Yeah. Good, good, good. <laughs> well. Um, just to wrap up, uh, we had Doug on a couple of weeks ago from LSK and, uh, it was super cool having him on, but we had a lot going on in the shop that day. And, uh, to make it up to him, I felt like we didn't give him the attention he deserved. So, uh, he was gracious enough to have us up to, uh, their shop up in Fontana. Yeah. And, uh, we got to do a podcast. Me and Hannah and Kevin went up there and spent an evening with him doing a podcast. We got a shop tour. Uh, that place is ridiculously cool um they were like mechanical engineers right yeah i'll tell you like or Cal a lot of guys. guys or whatever yeah so they actually share a compound with cal west manufacturing i believe that they're okay, technically yeah. the same building different or same yeah. company different entities mm -hmm. um, yeah but they had some machinery in there that heavy is, duty. Uh, 
just so hard cool. to even look at and wrap your brain around, you know, yeah. what that like thing's big old capable. robot that grabs a stick of 20 foot steel and zings it around and shoves it in the machine and it like laser cuts it. It's just super bitchy so stuff. They also so cool. fabricated um, a machine to milk a cow. <laughs> yeah, they had, they had a machine and they were like, what the hell is this? That's for milking cows. I'm like, all right, these guys are like into everything. The nicest, like stainless, sanitized, you know, yeah. sanitization grade, like fabricated, nice TIG welds. Cow utter machine. <laughs> I would love. I, I would love to do tours of shops that are just like random holes in the wall that you would never guess that do anything crazy. You know, yeah. like, um, I guess not my brother-in-law, but my sister's boyfriend. He works for his uh, parents' machine shop, and they're up there in Corona. David off, Engineering. David Engineering. That's the one. All the cool guys are named. David. <laughs> they're right off the. They're right off the 15 and the 91, right in that little corner there. And they just, like, they do jobs for Caltrans, like, for those big trucks that you see that have that swing down, like, cushion on the back of them for mm -hmm. road workers and stuff. Like, yeah. they build a bunch of parts for that. Um, they do work for Rock Jock and Curry, like, build parts for them, you know, like, bump stop brackets or whatever, and just random stuff. It's like, dude, I want to take a whole tour of these places and just see what it's all about, you know? Just talk to the guys that work there, too, that have yeah. some cool back pocket knowledge. You yeah. Know, like. yeah. This guy next door... To us, he's a machine shop, and he makes molds that make the bezels for uh, traffic lights. Yeah, like every traffic light that is in out like there. the UK or here or wherever. Yeah. Like he makes the molds so that they can inject them with plastic Injection or molding, steel yeah. or whatever it is. But like he just makes them. Like wow. and they're huge. They're literally. And like, he's like a oh, thousand yeah, he years big. old. Yeah, that dude's like <laughs> straight up ninety and just. He's so, there every he day before every single one of us, and he. He'll be He's there still there day. right now. <laughs> yeah. Do you know that uh, my my old boss, I don't know if he wants me to say his name, but a person I used to work for that's in the same business complex as us, I don't know if he invented the machine or the concept or whatever, but he basically like created what we know now is like the uh, the see-through egg carton. Really? The like the clear, like the plastic ones? I could totally be misquoted in this, but he told me this story maybe like a year ago now that um, in the in the egg or food industry, they call it finger fucking the eggs where everyone opens up, you know, the um, to see the if they're broken, see if they're broken or not. And you spin them. And so I don't I don't think he came up with the, the idea or the concept of the clear carton, but I believe that he made and ran and basically managed the whole process of making of the machines that made those egg cartons, the clear ones. He... He made the machine to make them. You know what so I mean? So crazy. Like what? Random. That's so crazy. Yeah. Like, because that's like a th industry standard now to have a clear egg carton. Yeah. Like, it's wild. Except for saving the turtles. Screw the turtles. Maybe not I don't saving think the, the turtles. turtles really care about. They can't get an egg fine. carton in their nose. They're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Screw well. the turtles. So. Um, it's got like so three time, people that aren't listening to us so anymore. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna try and do shop tours. That'd be super fun. Dude. Yeah, yeah we need to seconds. do we, we need to make some videos for you guys. So keep please go to our YouTube and subscribe so that when we do get those videos up on how to do all the work on your own Jeep, they'll be available for you. Um, We're halfway to our goal, by the way. Thanks for all the help. Yeah, halfway What's to our goal. goal. We need we need more subscribers. We need a thousand subscribers. To not get canceled. To not get canceled. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you could help out, the more subscribers, the better. Um, I know your mom and dad and grandma have a phone. Just go ahead and just log into it and do it. <laughs> and log in for them and just hit subscribe. They're gonna want to watch our stuff too. On but, another note too, me and Jake and Drew are done with our TV show. Yeah, so more on that. We're, we're we'll, back we'll in full force. We can't talk about it because of NDAs and stuff like that, but um, we spent the last four months just in a living hell of East Los Angeles filming a TV show for, I can't even say what it's for. So um, now that he's teased you and has is not going to deliver, just keep listening. Eventually we'll yeah. be able to tell you. It was fun, though. It was a good time. We but, wrapped it on uh, Friday, or actually Saturday. Saturday it's about yeah. male underwear models. Yeah. yeah. Oh, fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> apparently okay Why? what is that? so fun fact no that reminded me of it because in the production world if say you're out say you're out on set on location like somewhere in a park or whatever and you're filming something right mm -hmm. and bystanders come up and they go oh what are you filming um the industry standard is to say you're doing a mayonnaise commercial oh that's just the answer they that's get? just the answer that everybody gives out like oh yeah it's a commercial for mayonnaise and yeah, they awesome. go, they go. Oh wow, that's cool. You know, like keep walking. I, I would elaborate you. on that so Dude, much. And so, <laughs> one girl that you I was are. talking to, 
and I just figured this out like last week. And one girl I was talking to that was like part of our production. She was out on on set, and somebody came up and they go, "Oh yeah, what are you guys doing?" She goes, "Oh, we're filming a commercial for a mayonnaise company." And he goes, "Oh really? What brand?" And she See, was that's like, "Exactly what I would say." Uh, like, mayonnaise? <laughs> yeah, like whichever yeah. one it was. She like she was like, "Man, I really didn't think I don't. I've never had somebody like have a elaborate on it." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she goes, I "They're gonna be all so mad it. at you now. You just threw." I just gave away the, the industry standard. <laughs> I know. Don't I thought that was that. so funny though. Like, yeah, we're shooting a commercial for mayonnaise. It's super random. That's like the <laughs> la- if I was trying to rattle something random off, for sure it wouldn't have been like mayonnaise. Yeah, perfect. Because then I you start. Been, people, I probably would have brought up cow water machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You start telling people we're doing a car show and you know freaking Snoop Dogg's a host or whatever. They're gonna be like, is Snoop Dogg here? What kind of cars are you building? Are you doing this? You know, like it goes down a rabbit hole. You tell people hey, you're you'll doing never get mayonnaise. Anything done. You tell people you're doing a commercial for mayonnaise and stop asking questions. They just they're like seventy percent uh, of the world doesn't like mayonnaise anyway, so they're just yeah. like Meh, yeah. and they walk yeah, away. And I think that's him over there. No mayo, Kevin. Are you talking about the one with olive oil in it? Because that one's really good. Yeah. <laughs> or avocado oil. Avocado oil, those are good too. Hell yeah. The one the one fact I did look up that I was totally wrong on and Jake was slightly right on too. I was super right. I on messed it. up on my on on my weights the last time we did this. It's like your tires were like hundred and thirteen pounds. Ah. Wheel and tire. Not two hundred. Still a lot. Still a lot. Still a lot. That's, and it, that's, that's me. thirty seven. I am yeah. I want you to picture me wrapped around your axle <laughs> going down the road for me. <laughs> and it, and it's 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 crazy to see the differences between tires and Actually, wheels. Maybe too. No. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. You know, David's super cool OMF bead locks that he has and a you know, a pro comp tire at thirty sevens with I mean you have most of your tread, I would say. Yeah, they're um, pretty fresh. You know, that was hundred and thirteen pounds and I think David with white JL, his was those those uh those were black Toyo, rhinos, black, yeah, black black rhinos, rhinos and, with and uh, Toyo no, they're, they're uh they're Coopers. Were they? Oh, they were Coopers. You're and right. His probably the same thre- same tread at the same time as you. Yeah. His there was like a five or six pound difference there. I want to so, weigh. I want to weigh, weigh the dude 40. with the Gladiator that has the Toyo Open Countries and the black rhinos. Oh, those things because I can heavier. guarantee th- that whole setup is 150 pounds. That is a heavy, like, you, you could tell a difference. Like, when you pick up so many, I mean, kind of the standard in our industry, not to go on for another half hour, but, like, the standard in our industry is, like, 37s on a 17-inch wheel, and they're normally 12 and a half or 13 and a half wide. Like, they're the same tire. Like, yes, we get 40s, we get 35s, but, like, when you pick up enough 37s, you know what they kind of weigh. Mm-hmm. But you go to pick up one of those things, and it's, like, 10 to 20 pounds heavier. You're like, Jesus Christ, is this a 40? You know? <laughs> well, dude, you look how much material is on one of those wheels. Dude, they're huge. And like the lug nut in the insets like an inch and a half further in, and it's just this big old, huge. Yeah. Hung- I mean, what? I mean, maybe they're super strong. I, we don't know. We've never yeah. wheel tested them. I'm- but opposed to a normal wheel where you can see like, an inch of lug nut sticking out like these ones the lug nut is straight buried in the wheel oh yeah oh, you yeah. know and All even that I, I would assume that rotating mass in that sense too probably gives you quite a bit of different drivability issues too tons of drivability um, yeah you know i mean yeah. you even saw it with your lexus you put super lightweight wheels on it did i drop that car is super efficient you actually said you saw like a mile like a miles per gallon change yeah and it was not six, a lot but it was saw six it. pounds per corner but when you're talking about a car that only weighs three thousand pounds and like that rotating Thing's a 1.8 liter, dude. It's got like 100 horsepower. So when you take a little bit of weight off, it's like, dude, this thing's zippy now. You know, yeah. it turns yeah. all it turns all nimble. It's all it's all legit. Well, that's yeah. the, that's the game in off road, right? You don't necessarily. It's not necessarily bad to have heavy wheels and tires because it gives you a little bit more low CG, right? Like you want to keep your weight down. Down. Yeah. Um, but then you get on the road to drive home, and you're like. <sighs> You know, yeah, things just. I a mean, even dog. sucks. Nick and I even talked about it with the samurai, just in preparation for January. Is is would it be beneficial or not for us to go to aluminum wheels on the samurai? Because every ounce of rotating mass on that car is would help. It, yeah. Is if we can lighten that thing up everywhere, yeah, it's huge. But is it going to be a pound on all four corners? Is it going to be seven or eight? Yeah, pounds? is it going to be seven or eight pounds? Um, you know, is it 
going to be a big difference where we're going to see feel the difference in the car, or was it like when we just spent a bunch of money on aluminum wheels? And I don't know because you eh. can use you have to use a lot more aluminum to make a strong wheel than you do. No, you're steel, totally right. Yeah, right. So yeah, but then steel is heavier than aluminum. So and we've all seen what Nick's wheels look like on the Samurai right now. And dude, they're so is tiny, an aluminum wheel going like, to hold up to that? It's like, more of a rally car, dude. That's what's great about that thing is like every other Samurai in that class is all in like these big 35s Toyota axles. They're so wide, and we're just this little itty bitty thing. Dude. I love the way that thing it's looks. So Every good. last little detail, right down to even like the the color of your guys's number sticker. I don't know if it'll be different this year, but like just everything, the way you guys built it, it is such a cool looking car. Like, yeah, I love it. We tried, and if you want to see it, sometimes it shows up at Tony Tuesdays. Which it's not is... broken right now; it's alive again, so it'll be back next week. Every time yeah. I show somebody a picture of that thing, they're like, "That thing races hammers." <laughs> they're like, "That's sick!" You know, they get all pumped on it because it's like so out of the norm to see like. Not a stock samurai, but like not a super modified vehicle. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Even the stuff that's done to it, it's kind of hard to see because it is so low and the tires do fill the wheel wells, but there is, you know, a tuned 20 Fox behind there. There is some king bump stops on it. There's, mm-hmm. there's some cool stuff and there's, you know, all of us put a little touch in that thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see how she does so again this year. So, what is next Tuesday? The 8th, 7th, 8th? Yes. Yeah, I've, I've got a few notes to go over here folks okay so (laughs) by the time you watch this it's going to be friday which means that our podcast with lsk came out yesterday so if you want to go give that a watch it's on the lsk uh youtube page i think it was really fun i thought we had some super cool conversation about like what is the very polarizing side-by-side industry a lot of pros a lot of cons um that was uh, that was super awesome so thank you for lsk after the shit show that we gave you, thank you for inviting yeah. us. They're giving us a whole tour. That was really cool. I'm excited to watch it. Yeah, I can't oh, wait. Fire. Um, How much? One dollar? Secondarily, Tuesdays, this coming Tuesday, the 8th of August, is our next Tony Tuesdays. I can't believe it's already Tony Tuesdays again, but it is. We're going to have the same you know, deal, playing some games, raffling off some parts. Um our kind of like hit thing last time was we were going around asking people some trivia questions that turned out to be hilarious. The one with Nick was really funny. Oh yeah. Oh, he got you. Yeah, he they're totally on our did. Instagram <laughs> if you want to see it. But Nick, Nick really got me actually. He he made me look a little stupid, but that's okay. Uh, but yeah, we asked a bunch of questions that surprisingly, like a lot of people couldn't answer, and it was just so funny. It actually kind of ended up going a little bit viral. <laughs> so go watch those and study up because we got more coming. Yeah, we're gonna get you. If you're at Tony Tuesdays, we're gonna get you. You better bring your your A game. You're gonna have to study up on like so many random facts too, because we're not telling anybody yeah. like, what you're getting. It's just. <laughs> Oh, I'm not even asking anyone else for help with the questions. I'm coming up with them so that I can get everybody. Yeah. Yeah. She's, yeah. She's she tried to sneak attack me, but it didn't work. <laughs> also, watching David make people run for stuff is pretty entertaining. I know. I know a little. <laughs> I know a little bit about a lot. Is all I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, well, I've got a question for you on Tuesday. Then. Yeah. Oh. Throw one out there right now. Let's I hope do it's it. No, I can't related. spoil it because then they'll know. Well, the you better answer. have more questions than just one. <laughs> oh, I've got a lot of. I've got a whole notepad in there of questions. Um, and then on top of that, we're going to start posting every Friday around maybe 10 to noon or so. I don't know off the top of my head what the exact time is, but every single Friday, you can start to expect a brand new video from us. We're going to do podcasts every other Friday. Um, and then in between, we're going to kind of alternate between uh, just like some fun videos, like maybe just like what a Friday at Bet Motorsports looks like. Mm-hmm. Sometimes us. it's taking naps on the ground. Yeah. And, then, and she's talking about YouTube. That's what we're going to. Yeah. All on up. YouTube. We, we post videos on Instagram like every single day, but on YouTube, we're going to do every other Friday for the podcast. And then in between those Fridays, um, you can watch us attempt to buy a limo. <laughs> Sometimes it's working on jet skis. Yeah. It just seems to be like a 75% of the time kind of thing. Yeah. We might you be, never know. We might <laughs> be you never know what you're going to get. Explorer. Yeah, we've got some big news on the way when it comes to hammers. I don't know if we should talk about don't it. Don't say yet. anything. No. Okay, sorry. You guys are going to be racing with a freaking jet ski on the back of that thing that has our name <laughs> on it just for oh shits and giggles. God. Dude, Nick and I will put one on your roof on the roof if you want. We might use it as like a ramp Dude, to get up stuff. You know the so. you, you know the little like Yakima like storage things? Yeah. Put a jet ski on there and fill it with tools and shit and then that's your tool storage. I mean and it also looks cool. People would be stoked on that. It's like the it's like the Mad Max. Of, uh, do you King have like a jet ski you're willing to do? Absolutely. Dispose? Like one that if it dies, it Absolutely. dies. Absolutely. 
I'm down. All right. <laughs> More to come. More to come on that. Yeah. The and then the only other thing I'll throw in there is that we're gonna try and do some cool like fun like product reviews, if you will. We're gonna do yeah, some, I'm some looking forward reviews. To that. We've already got some pretty funny ideas in the works of actually some some pretty cool knowledge that I think you could really utilize. It's not all just fun and games. It's gonna be like some good technical knowledge of, you know, buyer beware stuff and maybe some also how to save some money at Harbor Freight and things like that. So um, and then what was my very last point? Oh, we still have literally everything that you could ever need on our website. And if we don't, send us an email because we'll still sell it to you. And we have a discount code for you, which is CUTWATER10. That'll get you 10% off everything. There's lights, lockers, and literally everything in between that you could possibly need. You could so. go get a whole crate axle on there and put CUTWATER10 in there and get 10% off of it. Or a t-shirt or a sticker pack. Can I get a sticker pack? You can get a sticker. You got to go on the website. It's ten. It, I haven't actually gone on the website yet. I, oh, what a wow. wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. All right. We, good to hear reviews coming up. Let's go. Sorry. All right. Thanks uh, off the grid. And thank you, Cutwater. Thank you, everybody. Not Jake. <laughs> <laughs> you really haven't gone on the website? No, I may have gone on it once or twice.